Hello, Nick. How are you? Yeah, I'm not too bad, thanks, mate. How are you? I'm I'm good. I'm in a, a good mood. I've listened to some good music to refresh me. Oh yeah, what have you been listening to? Um, my go-to song, "I Smile" by Kirk Franklin. Now, if we had the, uh, the the legal rights to do so, we'd probably cut a little bit of that music into this bit. Of the yeah, it's, it, you cannot help but smile when you hear it. Well, we've had a great chat today, haven't we? Oh. Uh, brilliant, uh, Nick, and for me, Sean, uh, she falls in love with her passion. You can feel it, and she's created and built community at Catalyst, and that's her love. Yeah, no, I think it came so through so clearly, didn't it, and what she was sharing there, that, and it was really, really powerful to hear about the journey that she's taken Community Catalyst on through her leadership, uh, genuinely authentic uh caring and loving leadership i think as well and she'll be a massive loss to the organization but i think as she said she leads it in a in a good good position for someone new to to take the reins on it she leads with power of vulnerability you know and and courageous when to say no that's takes some courage especially when you don't want to uh, be seen for chasing money yeah absolutely you know so i salute her definitely well you can certainly hear from uh, Clinton and I listeners that uh, we're big fans. So we'll let you uh, explore that yourself. So without further ado, here's Sean Lockwood, who is the retiring CEO of Community Catalysts. Ooh, welcome everyone to the latest episode of Changing It Up, sometimes also known as Com Chats, depending on uh, who's listening. Uh, today we have with us Sean Lockwood, who is the outgoing, both in personality and position, CEO of Community Catalysts, uh, and the founder as well, and both a good uh, colleague and friend to both Clenton and I. So we're delighted to have Sean with us here today, Sean. Thank you very much for coming along. I'm delighted. We've got our usual quickfire questions that we asked Sean, uh, and then we've got some, some uh, of our more meaty questions to get into. Uh, later on so without further ado we'll uh, we'll kick off so my first question sean is if you could only eat one dish or meal for the rest of your life what would it be um i think off the top of my head this is going to sound gross egg and chips yeah why not big support from lovely lovely now tell me we've got to clarify how the eggs produced the eggs are fried in butter Mm-hmm. Um, because I, I'm, I'm assuming I'm going to die quite soon, so I don't need to worry about cholesterol. Um, they're fried in butter. I've got two, um, and they are um, organic eggs because they taste better. Um, and my chips are deep fat fried, um, and they are double double fried. Is it double fried? So they're fried and then fried again, so the outside is really crisp. That is my idea of heaven. And the and they're sunny side up, so and the yolk is um, is runny, but the white is properly set. That's nice. exactly. I can see them on a plate. Oh, you painted a beautiful picture of these these eggs. I, I think this is the sort of detail our listeners really crave. So, um, <laughs> thanks for that. And I think you can get triple fried chips now. Um, in yes, frozen ones. Because I uh, a couple of New Years ago bought some triple fried fried chips and then deep fried them again, so they were quadruple fried chips. And I can tell you. Excellent chips that they were. Exactly. Uh, Clinton, I'll hand over to you for the next question. I have to admit that both of you are giving me such an in-depth into uh, the double and triple frying of chips. So I say thank you very much for sharing that. Um, oh, my question would be, and if you could only go to one more place <gasps> on holiday for the rest of your life, where would that be? Oh, Cape Town. Absolutely. Don't even have to think about it. It's, Ooh, uh, can it's, I ask why? We lived in Zimbabwe, um, my husband and I, for 34, 36 years ago. We lived in Zimbabwe for two years. We had a holiday during that period and we went to South Africa, which was still under apartheid. And so quite, uh, you know, 
I didn't feel good as a tourist there, but Cape Town was always a kind of free spirit in, in, the, in that world. And so it was then very beautiful um, and, um, and it, it felt um, a freer place. Uh, 35 years later, probably, no, not that long, 33 years later, um, my daughter, my oldest daughter, was living and studying at Cape Town University, in Cape Town, at Cape Town University. And we had a three week holiday there. I, I, I stepped out in the morning and I looked at Table Mountain and it was sunny and it was beautiful and I just loved it. And I, it was total happiness, total joy. That's why. Thank you. That's one of my places I'd love to go to mm. uh, South Africa and just to see Table Mountain. Now, Sean, how do you like to pass the time? Do you have any particular hobbies or particular interests? Well, I'm about to take up a hobby. Would you like to hear about that? Which is chicken keeping. This is, this is working towards retirement. I've always wanted chickens because I wanted, wanted my own eggs. Nice. Um, and I like chickens. And I have three on order. I have a chicken coop uh, downstairs ready to be put up, which I had for Christmas. So that's my new hobby. Um, but my other, I mean, walking, I, we've got dogs. So I, I do a lot of walking with the dogs. Um, I don't know if it's a hobby or not, but I'm very involved in my local church as well. So that's um, time consuming anyway. Yeah, thought of any names for these chickens yet? Yeah, I have. They are going to be Annie, uh, Cluckabell. These are my children, my kids have named this Cluckabell. And I can't remember, Eggstein, I think is the other one instead of Einstein, I think. <laughs> so. And when you say your kids, these are people in their thirties. They're people in their thirties, yeah. <laughs> yes. They've got heavily into it. There was a whole family wops up chain about the names of these chickens. So they think it's ridiculous. They think that this is eccentric to want to keep chickens. But I believe I believe I will love my chickens and my dogs will not eat my chickens. That is a real danger. Think of those delicious fried eggs you'd be having. Indeed, with chips. So uh, <laughs> Quadruple fried chips, clearly. Yeah. My question is, what was the last TV show you watched that you really enjoyed and why? Well, there are two at the moment ongoing. One is um, uh, It's Sin, um, which um, I, I, I was just, I mean, it's amazing. It's, I remember that period very well um, when HIV AIDS was sweeping through um, the gay community in, in Britain. And um, I lost a, a friend to HIV AIDS early on. So it's stunning. I mean, it's just a, an amazing, gripping, moving, upsetting, wonderful programme. Um, so I'm watching that. And I'm also watching Schitt's Creek, which is uh, lovely, <laughs> lovely American sitcom, um, which is just delightful the people are quirky and splendid and I enjoy it and it's also it's about half an hour so if I'm it slots into other things and what was the last book you read Sean you mentioned you like reading as well the book I read which I really loved um which was recommended by Hugh John from CVT is the year of marvelous ways? I don't. Do you know it? It's 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 about uh, that. Marvelous ways is a person. Um, it's based in Cornwall, and it's uh, she lives alone, and it's about the last year of her life. Really, she's she's fairly elderly. Um, she's very amazing. She lives in an abandoned village um, that she had grown up in. And it is the most beautifully written um, and inspirational book I've read for a long time. It's super. John, this is the killer question. You have a million pound. Uh, uh, what would you do in 12 months with a, a million pounds? Oh, oh, I know. I know. I would buy the land and the building I need to set up my daughter's charity. That's what I do with it. A million pounds would actually be quite handy because what she wants to do is she wants to set up a, a kind of rural environment with lots of horses in it for 
uh, people, children and people, children and adults with autism or learning disabilities. So that million pounds would be fab because there's a farm in North Yorkshire that has my name written on it. <laughs> Fantastic. Well, thanks, Sean. We've really uh, got to got to know you a little bit better there from from those questions. Really appreciate those answers. As many people will know listening to this, you are retiring and recruiting for the new CEO of Community Catalyst, which is the organisation that you established some 11 years ago. Um, So we're really interested in hearing about your journey. And we've got a a number of questions about that. So the first one, why did you set up Community Catalyst in the first place? What what was it that that took you on that that journey? Well, um, at the time, I was CEO of what's now Shared Labs Plus, and Angelo was the head of development there, we'd become aware that really small enterprises that weren't shared lives, shared lives is a very defined uh, model. Uh, so lots of other small stuff that were, were doing great things that were really valued by the people who were being, who were using them and, um, and who gave people really good local choice of stuff at a time when personalization had come in as the big kind of push by government they were all dying because um and having to close because the world of regulation and legislation and bureaucracy local authority bureaucracy was just impossible for them it, they weren't designed for them and you, you know you were having local authority strategies which were around uh, minimising the number of people they contracted with and kind of forcing people to close or merge and become bigger. Um, and we believed, we, Shared Lives Plus, me, um, believed passionately that if people were going to, this is an old old argument now, but if people were going to um, really have real choice, then you needed a diversity of stuff available. Um, and we, I suppose, particularly believed that really small, locally delivered and, um, activities, enterprises, solutions um, were, were the kind of things people wanted uh, rather than the big uh, provisions that slotted people into, into what they had. So, so it was driven by personalization. Um, so anyway, we persuaded Department of Health to fund a project which Shared Lives Plus ran, to develop and test ways to support really small enterprises that were delivering stuff people wanted locally. Um, and <clears throat> it worked. We tested it in Oldham. We did. We co-designed the model with those small enterprises that had either died or were just about hanging on, um, who were saying what was needed. We tested it in Oldham and Kent. Both of them were kind of big, passionate about personal budgets or direct payments. And then we found it worked. It worked very quickly um, and it it was transformative very quickly. Um, so we wrote, as you do, a practical guide. I remember that uh, <laughs> strongly. And it was launched with enormous razzmatazz by the minister of the time. And we knew it would just go on people's shelves. All those people who said, oh, this is a wonderful idea, would either not do it or do it badly. So uh, that's why we launched Community Catalyst. And I say we, a lot of it, because a lot of this was with Angela, Angela Catley from Community Catalyst, who was part of the the thinking um, of it. So it it was set up. Uh, with a business model which kept a very had a very small core team which could grow or shrink depending upon the financial environment we were in Um, and initially we didn't get grants at all this was all about we knew how to do this and we wanted to help local authorities do it well initially it was all about personalization but then very quickly um, there was a kind of separate passion which was about all the untapped gifts and talents that lay in in people living in local communities that were just not, had no outlet because the world of enterprise was incredibly complicated for them. I suppose the other thing, um, the other, the other thing that happened very early on is that, I mean, the 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 methodology, um, how we help people is not rocket science. It's really about patient coaching and um, it works well for everybody. And so we had community enterprises setting up that were run by people um, who themselves had had a need for 
social care support of one kind or another or health support. So we, we kind of saw a, um, um, a, a, a disappearance of the differentiation between people who gave stuff and people who needed stuff. Everybody has skills and gifts and everybody needs stuff. Uh, I'd just like to pick up some of what you've just uh, uh, expressed. And my question really is around what has been your biggest achievement and biggest challenge during the last 10 years? Well, I would say my biggest achievement, with the help of a lot of other people, is a community catalyst 11 years on, which has stayed true to its aims, has done some amazing stuff. This is not me, it's the people who've kind of coalesced around Community Catalyst um, and is successful, you know, is surviving, not more than surviving, is thriving and is an organisation that can be handed on. Being true to our aims has been really important. So we've stayed passionate about choice. Um, Our aim has always been about people having the choice of the stuff they need that help them live the life they want. Um, how we do that has changed slightly over the years. Um, so as well as the work to support community enterprise, we very soon moved into um, a strand of work which we call People Can, which is all about helping people um, who've got labels um, or who are seen as people with support needs to, un- to find out what they're great at and what they want to do and then help them do it. Uh, our biggest challenge, well, we nearly went bust in year two. That was quite a big challenge. It takes time to get traction. We got to year two um, and the contracts weren't coming in quite fast enough. The reserves that we had as a result of the grant uh, were beginning to diminish. Um, and I was very lucky with my board, actually, because instead of saying, oh, too scary, let's close this, they said, let's do it month by month. Let's review it month by month. And at the same time, um, the the core team um, were very lucky to have a very um, strong business manager with a strong commercial background. And she uh, helped us focus on getting the work in that would allow us to keep going month by month. And that's what we did. Um, And the other thing we did, Clinton, is we walked away from a few contracts during that period. And I'm really proud, I won't name the organisations that came to us, but there were organisations who came to us who I think wanted whitewashing a bit, you know, thought, oh, that's really, you know, that's sounding quite funky. Let's let them come in and do a bit of that. But it wouldn't have been anything other than uh, window dressing. And, but they were offering, you know, money at a time when we were struggling to get contracts in and we did walk away from that. And I'm really proud of that. Thanks, Sean. That's that's really in, insightful to hear all that. One of the things you often shared with me and taught me was about holding your nerve, not losing sight of the bigger vision, holding your nerve and uh, just trusting that things were going to be OK. And uh, the fact you all managed to do that is obviously to great credit of you all as a team and your leadership. And, and as you said, you lead the organisation in, in, a, in a good shape, uh, mm. despite the impact of, uh, of COVID over the last 12 months, which has obviously had a devastating impact in so many different ways and in individuals, communities and organisations. But Community Catalyst is still very relevant and playing an important part in all of that. So with all of that in mind, what, what is your hope for the future of the organisation and what sort of direction do you see it going in or could you see it going in? I mean, I, I think I hope uh, my lovely board appoint somebody who isn't like me, who has different skills, different networks, different um, strengths, uh, because I think, I think Community Catalyst could go almost anywhere. I mean, what we're doing is as relevant for um, supported housing, housing associations, or um, uh, certainly health, and we're beginning to uh, work in health, um, and um, criminal justice, people um, in the criminal justice system. There are all sorts of areas and networks that, um, that we could build and we could move into. Um, I think the people can strand will get stronger and stronger. You know, there's a lot of people talking about strengths-based working and the People Can Strand is is all about strengths 
in reality. You know, it's it's really doing stuff with strengths based working. I think local area coordination. I could see local area coordination network growing, obviously, but also the learning from local area coordination is 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 interesting in in thinking about how that might be applied differently in different areas. Uh, I've got a two part question that hopefully leads or lends itself. Sean, what do you see your legacy community catalyst? I think the team, you know, hugely strong team. The people who've worked with us have continued and then, you know, left because a lot of people have time limited posts because they're doing projects. Those people are, um, are becoming strong advocates for different ways of working. Um, so that's a bit of a legacy, but mostly, no, it's the organisation, what it's done and what it's continuing to do. I'm excited by some possible developments, which will mean we stay, we provide better, stronger support for the community microenterprises out there. There's about four and a half thousand of them now that we've worked with. Um, and um, so that, yes, they're also a legacy as are your local area coordination programmes. It's you know, what it's done, that's the legacy. It, it will carry on um, and that will be wonderful. And for you, Sean, what's next for you? <laughs> and what is the biggest hope for your future? Oh, I need, well, I, I have spent my whole working life fighting for stuff, <laughs> mostly around, you know, really great personalised solutions that help people. Um, I, it will be really difficult to think of giving that up. How I do it, Clinton, I don't know at the moment. It's, um, I've, I've had to time the, my retirement because there are family um, needs at the moment that I just want to be able to spend time with. I mean, I, I just, I need a new challenge, a new project. Um, my hens will not provide that, I need to say. They will be a delight, but they are not going to be the purpose of my life. But I don't know what, I don't know what yet. Um, I, am, I am waiting for the, um, you know, to see what comes along. Thank you, Sean, for uh, enabling us to have uh, an insight into who the real Sean Lockwood is. So personally, thank you for everything that you, uh, you continually do. Sean, thank you so much for coming on and sharing all that. It's, as Clinton says, it's been a real privilege to get that insight into your journey uh, and your work there. And really excited to see what this next chapter for you looks like, because it certainly doesn't sound like retirement. It sounds like moving into a new chapter, new challenges that are ahead and yet to be seen when the time's right. I'm sure you'll, you'll grasp those opportunities. And from both of our perspectives, and certainly from mine, just want to say a massive thank you for all you've taught me over the two years that I've, I've had the privilege of working with you uh, and just wish you every success in your um, in your next chapter and uh, thank you very much again for, for sharing everything with us today. Oh it was a delight thank you very much. I personally want to say thank you for uh, supporting me and, uh, uh, and walking alongside me at times where I dated myself so thank you very much Sean. Well, that was always a privilege, Clinton, and I am absolutely determined that we'll continue to, uh, to stay friends.